you need to do proper research for the industry that you're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, it's not often that someone is getting into an industry that they are just the true pioneer in, which means that somewhere there is a competitor who's already figured out a lot of the stuff that you need to figure out. The other big thing is you need to figure out what is so different about you um, that a competitor is not already covering. You know, what is your sales proposition? What is your differentiating factor? Why should people give you money instead of your competitor? Welcome to Personal Finance Cat, where I share my personal take on personal finance. Hi, Bob. How are you? Wonderful. How are you doing today? Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I know that you are a founder and CEO of a consulting company called yes. Oxford Pierpont. Yes. But your journey didn't start there. You were a corporate employee for yeah. a long time prior to that. I understand that you worked, your last role at least, was the director of operations development at right. Solutions. Right. And you provided business development solutions for the customers at the time. Can right. you talk about that role and how it helped you generate certain skills that helped with your current business? Yeah, well, uh, back when I was normal and had a normal job like everyone else, <laughs> I, uh, my job was really to look for problems um, in the company, and I usually fix those things in 90-day cycles. And as you can imagine, that was a wide variety of things. If one month it was um, implementing a uh, training system, another month maybe it was um, like just redeveloping uh, the way that everyone is organized in the warehouse, um, because they were they were a printer development company. Um, another one might have been implementing a phone system. So there was a really wide variety of things that uh, that I had to do for that company. And it was exciting just because, I mean, uh, most people don't really get to do what they want for 90 days and, and to show up three months later and say like, hey, here's all the stuff that you guys have now that that's finished and then do it again. So I will say it was a great job. Um, the only reason that I left is because my sickle cell just kind of uh, got into the way there. And, you know, that the rest is history, basically. Yep, yep. So let's talk about that a little bit. I think your story was just very amazing, but it kind of started maybe as a dark turn because as yeah. it was described on your website, the sickle cell disease basically meant that you were out of a job essentially okay. and then there was a huge impact on your personal life as well so can you talk about that and what kind of experience you had what kind of struggles you had sure so um literally went blind in this eye i was already deaf uh in this ear and that just made me a liability um there was no way i was going to you know sue that company i love my job i love my bosses there was nothing i would have complained about um with that job and also i was just really uh really young so didn't really know what my options were so i was kind of thrust into the situation where i'm trying to figure out where am i supposed to get all this money from uh to pay the bills and live i didn't know at the time i didn't really have any experience with unemployment so i didn't know how they work at least in georgia the way it worked at the time was you got $1,300 or sorry, um, $1,200. So 300 a week, regardless of what your salary was, that was the limit, you know? So you've got to somehow fill in that gap where you've only got 1200 bucks now. And that really wasn't going to pay for anything. And the only thing that I knew how to do was really what I'd been doing, uh, the entire time in my career is just creating stuff. And so that's really how Oxford started, um, started taking on clients, uh, doing consulting, kind of listening to what their problems were, figuring out what the um, solutions were that needed to be implemented. And then of course, um, implementing those because it was a reflection of what I've been doing in, the cre in, in, uh, in my job. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's great. So can you describe the exact steps you took to make that happen? It must have been pretty difficult and challenging. Yeah. Well, the first thing was learning how to read. Um, that was a big one. <laughs> and I have, uh, I don't know if there are any Dragon Ball Z fans uh, watching this, but I have Goku to thank for my ability to read yeah. because at the time there was this, um, there's a show called Dragon Ball Super and it was only in Japanese. And if anyone watches anime, you know, they have these tiny little t uh, subtitles at the bottom of the screen and that's your English, you know, so that you can watch the show. Well, I couldn't see. And so, I was not going to miss any episodes of Dragon Ball uh, Super. And so I learned how to read those tiny subtitles. And by extension, um, that just made it easier as I was practicing to read everything else. Because 
the big jolt of losing the vision in this eye, it it was just kind of hard to to kind of relearn like, hey, here's how I'm supposed to see tiny text on a screen, you know. So um, so that happened first. The next thing was figuring out what I could do, um, how to start a business, how to find clients. One of my old bosses, he was uh, actually kind enough to refer me to one of his friends who was looking for some help. Started out uh, just, you know, building that person a website um, and just, you know, acquired more and more clients from there. And that's just really where everything took off. So it was in hindsight, you know, it's like, oh, wow, I'm glad that all these things happen. In the moment, it was like, oh, my goodness, why me? Why have all these things happened? So <laughs> so that's yeah. really where, where we are. I can imagine. Yeah. So it sounds like that first client that was introduced to you by your prior boss was really helpful. Mm -hmm. But how do you now develop your clientele typically? It's funny because um, a big portion of what we do for clients is marketing, but we don't actually do any marketing uh, for ourselves. And for the kind of business that I'm in, it's really a relationship based business. Um, you do good work for people. You are fair to people, and then those people are willing to introduce you to their, uh, you know, to their, their colleagues. And um, the only thing I would really stress, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do things that way on this referral basis, is really focus on finding a good pool of people that have a good pool of people. So um, what I mean by that is, if you have a whole bunch of customers, even if you're just starting out and they really don't have a whole lot of money, maybe they are uh, really starting out in their business, they're not really where they need to be, they can only usually introduce you to other people that are at that level. So that's the one thing I would make sure I change as quickly as possible for someone starting this is meet people who are um, operating at a higher level so that you are able to network and refer and get referrals um, that are actually useful. Makes sense. Yeah. And so on your website, you do provide a range of different services from mm -hmm. building website to very high level consulting and your clients range from smaller businesses to multinational companies. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about exactly what kind of solutions you provide to these clients? Yeah, so um, I would kind of explain it like you're talking to a doctor and you go to the doctor, you tell your, uh, your primary care physician like, hey, these are the symptoms that I'm experiencing, right? These are my problems. It's your doctor's job to know and have the experience and knowledge to know like, hey, these symptoms are caused by this thing. And then based on that knowledge, give you a prescription that's going to take care of the problem. We operate in very much the same way. So um, one company, their issue might be financing. Another one, their issue might be staffing. Another one, their issue might be their uh, website and their marketing. Another one might uh, be something simple where it's just uh, some copywriting or some business processes. So we listen to our clients and then we implement whatever solutions were appropriate for their particular problem. Uh, typically, people don't just have one problem. So we do, um, I guess, have a lot of repeat business just because after we've tackled one thing, then we're able to move on to the next thing with them. Um, however, I must make a big note here. We almost did not survive the pandemic um, in 2020. That's what moved us into financing. Um, and that's really where our focus is more than anything else now is on getting businesses uh, access to financing. Interesting. So in your prior role or roles, did you acquire these skills that you were able to utilize now? Or did you develop that as you build your business? Yeah. Developed um, a lot of it as I went along. Um, a lot of it just comes from experience. So you know, experience is the best teacher. You really learn what not to do. Yeah. And even better than experience is the experience of others. If you're able to learn from others and learn what not to do. Um, so that's really where a lot of, um, just a lot of what I do comes from. So it's funny, you talk to enough people. And I mean, when, when we were really going at, uh, as we first started, I was talking to people for 50 hours a week, just cons uh, consultations all day long, every single day. And you start to see that everyone has roughly the same number of patterns um, and problems, right? Very rarely is there some wild card outlier where they just hit you with something you've never heard before. Most people, it's usually, uh, I don't have enough money. Uh, no one knows that we exist. Um, my staff or I don't have staff or they're not really working efficiently or something along those lines. And then it's usually easy to fix from there. Got it. Yeah. 
Can you talk about a success story of some, either a small company or large, doesn't matter, how you sort of use your consulting expertise to help them transform? Yeah. Um, so before the pandemic, a big part of our business was uh, dealing with um, attorneys, um, attorneys and mortgage brokers. So one of our clients is uh, actually a subsidiary of Fairway um, Housing Corporation in Texas. I'll use them as the example. They didn't really have anything when uh, when we met. They were um, they needed a new website. They needed all the marketing. They needed the CRM. They needed all the stuff. And yeah, they're doing extremely well now, like extremely well. And I love when I can see like the stuff that we've done, you know, to someone else's benefit when they're using our marketing, when they're using our site, when they're using um, our graphics and everything like that. We've built multiple sites for them now. Um, so that would, they're definitely one of my favorites. Um, a less exciting example is actually uh, one of the very first attorneys that I worked with. I was cold calling because that's just where we were in the business at the time. We were still at the level of cold calling. Um, and so I'm cold calling uh, these attorneys. This is like eight in the morning. One picks up and I'm, you know, I go through my whole script and he proceeds to hang up immediately. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I call him back and I'm like, uh, I think we got disconnected. And I pick up right where I left off. And, you know, he's been with me since 2018. And, uh, you know, he's a nice guy now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just uh but he's i mean his his law firm has just changed so much since we started he's gotten multiple websites uh from us the graphics we did everything from scratch for him um and it's just really been an amazing thing to see your work pay off for someone else in that way so so yeah it's i like doing it <laughs> yeah maybe just a, f a few follow-up questions on what you just described True. so for those lawyers when you say they had nothing meaning they had no website no marketing tools and such right but they do have a business base like a revenue right. base and such okay so when we were starting um a lot of them were criminal defense attorneys and personal injury attorneys mm -hmm. um criminal defense is a little bit easier than personal injury um at the time facebook was way more helpful than they are now so you would be able to target people based on their location. Like I could see through Facebook targeting that, oh, you are at or near a jail. You're not normally at or near a jail. Maybe you need to start seeing some criminal defense ads, um, things like that. And uh, from building the website, if someone wanted to work with that attorney and they don't really have a polished presentation, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's harder to convince people to work with you. And so what we were able to give them is just a completely professional presentation that's representing them to the people that they want to work with. That means that now they're able to get more clients, they're able to get higher quality clients, they're able to charge more uh, for the people that they work with and build their business in a, in a more sustainable way. So that's what that's kind of what we did there. Cool, cool. So yeah. the it sounds like it's maybe Facebook ads is kind of the solution that was provided. At the time, uh, Facebook ads were extremely powerful. They were the cheapest and most powerful option. Nice. Um, and in June of 2018, I believe, yeah, it was about June 2018, that's when fa uh, Facebook had the whole Cambridge Analytica thing. And Mark Zuckerberg had to go and basically sit in front of Congress and tell people why all their, uh, their data is you know, just being breached and how they're using it and all this stuff. And so Facebook put a lot of policies in place that really restricted um, how you're able to use that data. And a lot of the things that you were able to do back then, and what I like to think of as the Wild West, you cannot do anymore. And then that was compounded by what Apple did with iOS 14.5, where uh, basically everyone, if you've got an iPhone, you've got to say like, hey, are you gonna let these people track you? For most people, the answer is no. <laughs> so, um, that also reduced how useful Facebook is. But as a supplement to that, Google kind of stepped up. YouTube ads are extremely powerful and uh, Google itself has always been just a powerhouse, hands down, expensive, but powerhouse. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So these um, strategies or tools like Facebook ads, YouTube ads and so forth, did you learn that all on your own or how did you acquire those skills to be able to offer those to the clients? So one big thing, and I tell people this all the time, only stupid people know everything. There is no end to the learning for as long as you live. And so one big way that I kind of honor that is I have always read 
10 articles um, every single day. There's always something changing. If anyone wants to see those articles, there's like, I think 3,000 of them now. <laughs> They're all collected on Flipboard. So if you just Google um, Oxford Pierpont Flipboard, you'll see you'll see the magazine. It's, it's all right there, everything that I've read and that I kind of archive. Um, but learning what other people are doing, taking courses, there are a number of free resources online. Google is a huge one. Facebook is a huge one. These companies want you to know how to use their stuff. Google especially. The level of detail that Google puts into their um, into their learning systems is just amazing. And so if you don't know how to use their platforms, it's just because that's just not what interests you, which is fine, but you know, the information is there. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Have you always been a curious learner, even when you were as an employee? Um, I like learning what I want to learn. <laughs> so, and I, I make that distinction because I always hated school. Um, I would, even in college, like I would show up for the first couple of weeks of class and uh, there'd always be some brainiac smart kid who has very detailed notes. And so before the exams and quizzes and stuff, I'd show up for those. I'd go find that kid, read through all their notes. 15 minutes later, here comes the, t the test or the quiz, spit all the information back out that I just uh, read. <laughs> and that's kind of how I operated. But for things that I want to know, things that I'm interested in, like I'm really interested in science and technology, I will just read about that all day. Like I love ChatGPT because I will just sit there and pick ChatGPT's AI brain all day about random things like atmospheric electricity. Like why? I'm not building any, uh, you know, any um, any generators or anything like that. But you know, it's it's just what I like to do. Cool, cool. So being an entrepreneur enabled you to do that more, I would imagine, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, passively, I would actually say no. Um, and the reason I would say no is, and this is the thing people don't really realize about the glorified version of entrepreneurship that we always see online. Typically, if you have a job, you show up at that place, do like eight to 10 hours, you go home. That's usually it. Now, after the pandemic, home and work has kind of blended a little bit, but you still have the ability to say, like, I'm not working right now. When you own a business, especially when you're starting a business, all the hats are on your head all the time. It's like you're never able to separate yourself from it mentally. Work-life balance becomes a real uh, challenge, at least it was for me. And so I find that whenever I'm awake, I always feel like I'm supposed to be doing something, like the to-do list never ever gets any shorter, um, which is fine, right? Because that's, that's, that's what I've chosen, but not everyone is prepared for that. And if you are in a business that is maybe not thriving or as successful as you'd like it to be, you've basically just created for yourself um, a job that turns into like this little self-imposed prison and you have to make sure you're not gonna fall into that trap. So from a time perspective, I do not have the time to do the things that I would like to do as often as I would like to do them. So, and that's something I still need to work on because I'm not perfect. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that honest truth. If you have to compare the two, which would you like better? If you have a choice, right? Would you be an employee or would you be your own oh. boss? Own boss, definitely. <laughs> um, the easy reason for that is at any given time, I can look around and see the accumulated uh you know total of all the things i've created you know um of all the work that i've done and it's all mine all of it at my job as much as i enjoyed what i did none of it was mine second year gone you get replaced and you know it's it's the business owners all that is their intellectual property it belongs to them the other big thing is that freedom while I definitely do not like having to work 16 hour days as, as I have now for the last, uh, what, six or seven years now, um, it's still my choice to do that, right? No one's making me do it. I go to my desk, I sit and I do my work because that's what I want to do. It's a different story when someone says, you have to show up here at this uh, time and place. And if you don't, there are consequences and everything you've worked for could possibly be taken away because you're fired. Now, of course, be a good person, be a good employee, don't find yourself in that situation in the first place. But the what I'm saying here is that freedom is really what comes with entrepreneurship. It has its drawbacks, obviously, because you can work yourself to death. 
but at least you have the choice to work yourself to death and it is directly to your benefit. And the biggest thing is for those entrepreneurs who make it, um, really transitioning from that small business to, you know, now I have an enterprise, I have a, a company, I have a board, I have a team, I have a staff. You don't usually have to work to that extent that you had to when you were starting out because you have people for that. The one big thing when you are the business owner that you can buy is other people's time. Employees don't really get to do that. You are trading your time for money when you are the boss, when you're the entrepreneur, the business owner, you're trading your money for other people's time. And there's a lot of magic in that because, I mean, I only get 24 hours, you only get 24 hours, but what if I wanna buy your eight? And I'll buy eight from this person and eight from that person and eight from that person. And now guess what? Suddenly I've got 32 hours of labor um, when just by myself, I'd have to be up all day and all night just to get the same, you know, not even 24 hours. So yeah, yeah. that's that's really where where I still feel blessed to have the career that I do, even though it is difficult. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. So what are some of the insights or lessons you learned through your entrepreneurship journey that you didn't have in your past experience? Um, the big one is really just about business administration um, and your finances. And this is something that I find is an issue with a lot of people. You can go make the most wonderful products in the world and, and de deliver the best services, but there still is a business that has to be run on the back end. And a lot of people, you know, you just don't really give it the attention that it needs and then it all comes to bite you later. And when I say business administration, I even mean the simple things like, how did you register your business? Are you still running around as a sole proprietorship or have you formally uh, done a limited liability company or corporation, right? Um, are you still, you know, putting your personal address on all of your documentation and, and everything? Or do you have a formal business address? Even if you don't have an office, a formal business address. And on its own, you think that these little things don't matter until someone asks for those and then they matter a lot. Bank accounts, are you still taking the business's money and putting it into your bank account, splitting, you know, sometimes you're spending money on the business, sometimes you're spending money on your personal bills, or do you have a separation there where you've got a dedicated business bank account, personal bank account, and you're able to separate those finances? Yeah, I mean, I could just go on and on, but the business administration is really the word that encompasses all that because it's the thing most people don't even think about and it's the one thing that really says that you are a legitimate, credible business that other businesses want to do business with. So I also noticed that on your bio, you kind of hinted that there's maybe a larger story. Maybe you have an even grander future plan. Can you talk about that? Oh, uh, let's see. I've not read my bio uh, since I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> So there are a lot, um, depends on which one we're talking about. I guess I'll say the, the one that's the end goal um, the, you know, bucket list thing. So before I go, I want to have um, just these enormous skyscraper vertical farms. Mm. That's, um, that's, that's it. That's the one thing that I feel like I'm working towards. Everything else is just, you know, detours uh, on the journey to getting to that destination. Um, and the reason I want that is because I want to be able to, uh, to feed kids. I feel like food deserts are a thing that really impact um, people who cannot necessarily um, take care of themselves or even have access to the th uh, to the foods that they need to take care of themselves. I feel like it's unfair that um, the healthier food options are insanely expensive, but the terrible food options are dirt cheap. And you're setting people up for failure. The reason I care about kids is because they don't really have any choice in the matter, you know? As an adult, you can always say, well, why don't you go and start a business or go get a better job or go get this education or go do all these various things. Kids are kids. They don't really have any choice in that. And so I wanted to create some kind of mechanism uh, to be able to solve that problem, get better nutrition and food uh, to those people for free, 100% for free. Um, and and that's, that's my thing. Everything else is leading up to that um, in various ways, so. That is the big end goal. There's a lot of little goals ahead of that, but that's the big one. Cool. I yeah. think I've seen those vertical farms that you were describing, right? They just build mm -hmm. plants somehow in the skyscraper building, and you can grow a lot of them because they can sort of spread or circle around the building. 
which seems yeah. very amazing. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, the technology has been around for a lot. Singapore um, actually has mm -hmm. a really good handle on it. Only thing that I want to do is just simply scale it. So taking the, it's not like I'm reinventing the wheel. I just want to take what other people have already done and then scale that um, and then put a business model behind it that allows me to give the bulk of that food away for free while still being profitable and sustainable. Um, I feel like if I have to charge for it, then, you know, just, just not what I want to do. Um, so I want to be able to give that food away for free. And that's, that's the big goal. So will it be some sort of a nonprofit organization that would do this kind yeah. of work? It'll be a nonprofit, but um, there still is a lot of revenue uh, that I have planned for it. For example, especially, and, and this is something I've been thinking about for a decade now, but it's become more apparent now as we're seeing the effects of climate change, it's going to get harder and harder and harder for farmers to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to place um, a self-sustaining uh, facility anywhere, um, where climate is no longer a factor because you're growing everything in a climate controlled environment um, with a fixed supply of, of water and, and other uh, resources, then now you're able to really, on a smaller plot of land, grow just as much as a farmer would have been able to grow, if not more, without having all those detrimental factors, um, and then lowering the cost. And if we're then able to take that food and sell it um, to you know, other businesses that need that quantity of food, grocery chains, um, restaurants, uh, you know, like for example, McDonald's, they have to get their heads of lettuce from somewhere. <laughs> Why not us? So um, that's what I want to be able to use to offset the cost of me giving away a lot of food uh, to children. That's wonderful. What are some of the advice that you want to offer to aspiring entrepreneurs who want to go on a journey similar to yours? Yeah, um, fix your credit. That would be the big one. That by itself would be the big one. And it's the thing you were like, fix your credit. Like, shouldn't you be talking about marketing or, you know, like sales or no, you can figure all that other stuff out. The credit is the one thing that no one tells you about. And then it takes forever to fix it once you've already done the damage. And the reason I say this is because undercapitalization is the reason that most businesses will end up failing. They simply run out of money and then they have no way to go get more money. You cannot go get more money if you do not have some form of uh, healthy credit, whether it's business credit or personal credit. And even if you have good business credit, lenders will still say, well, hey, we still need to verify that you can be responsible with money personally. So they're still going to look for you to have a 680 credit score. If you know that your credit score is under 680, go fix it. Don't try to uh, follow those Instagram you know, myths and gurus where they say, oh, you can just go to the IRS and get an EIN and go buy a car tomorrow. They're, they're leaving out so many steps <laughs> before that. And even if you wanted to go get that car with your brand new EIN, they're still going to verify that you have healthy credit, even if you're not personally guaranteeing the loan. So the one thing I will tell people is fix your credit. There's any number of business books and Googlings and YouTubers who will tell you all the other little things about running a business. But the one thing that they're not talking about is fixing your credit. And you can go to mybusinesscredit.com. Um, that, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but <laughs> go to mybusinesscredit.com and uh, we will teach you how to how to handle all that stuff. But yes, fix your credit. Cool. That's not what I was expecting, but very helpful. <laughs> I think you probably had a good starting point because you were already doing a similar line of work before you started your business. But yeah. for people who just want to go do something completely different from what they have been doing up until mm -hmm. that point, what would be some good advice to help people explore You know what would work for them? Well, you need to do proper research for the industry that you're getting into. Mm -hmm. um, it's not often that someone is getting into an industry that they are just the true pioneer in, which means that somewhere there is a competitor who's already figured out a lot of the stuff that you need to figure out. The other big thing is you need to figure out what is so different about you um, that a competitor is not already covering. You know, what is your sales proposition? What is your differentiating factor? Why should people give you money instead of your competitor? really take the time to do competitive research because, and I mentioned this earlier, the best lessons come from people who've already had to learn the hard way, right? So you're learning from the experience of others. 
see what your competitors are doing um, right, see what they're doing wrong, see what the averages are, right? If you see out of 10 of your competitors, they all seem to be doing this thing or speaking in this way or selling these products, that's probably what you also should be doing. Not because I'm saying to go follow the herd, but if you're starting out, you don't need to be reinventing the wheel right now and you know, focusing on super innovation, you definitely can later. But right now, to achieve profit, you need to figure out what profit even looks like for your particular um, industry. The other big thing is truly understanding why anyone should pay you for anything, okay? It doesn't matter if you have a podcast or if you have a restaurant. Why is anyone you know, expected to pay you for whatever it is that you're doing? And if you can't answer that question, you're probably not going to uh, get the profits that you want because if you can't convince yourself, uh, you know, that they, hey, this is what I'm selling, this is why people should buy it, why would anyone else <laughs> be convinced uh, to buy whatever it is that you are selling? So just really think truly um, about that business. And then as far as the model goes, you want to make sure that you're doing something that is considering the profit from the start so that you're not overdoing it and uh, overworking yourself and over leveraging yourself. I see a lot of businesses make that mistake too, where they will be selling something but they're selling it at such little profit or so inefficiently that they actually end up losing money every time they sell something. So you wanna make sure that, you are, um, that you are, your cost of goods or services sold is actually in profit, usually by, 300, uh, by at least 300%. Meaning if it, let's just say hypothetically, if it costs $100 for you to implement something, you should be charging no less than $300 for that product or service, very easy math. Um, so those would be the, the big things to kind of start out. The biggest one, of course, like I said, just look at what your competitors are already doing right because they've likely spent more money than you have and figured out what not to do more expensively than you have. That's great advice. Thank you so much for sharing. A couple of more questions left. Um, sure. Do you have any book recommendation or I think you mentioned you like reading articles, but do you also read books? And oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot of books. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, first, Richest Man in Babylon. That mm -hmm. one's going to help you cover the money stuff. Um, Think and Grow Rich. That one's going to help you cover the mindset. Uh, feeling is, is the secret. That one and Feeling is the secret. Um, let me back up. Richest Man in Babylon by um, George S. Clayton. Uh, Think and Grow Rich um, by uh, uh, not Dale Carnegie. Um, yes, Napoleon Hill. Hill. Sorry. <laughs> Dale Carnegie was who inspired him to write uh, Think and Grow yeah. Rich. So, yes, Napoleon Hill. Um, uh, Feeling is a Secret by Neville Goddard. Um, that one is really important to me. It's a very short book, but I like to go through that one all the time. Um, also get an Audible subscription because I like to have the physical books and the Audible so I can hear them twice. But that one especially will help you understand how to think about things in a positive way so that you're actually able to move towards the things that you want in life. If, um, if I can kind of explain that a little bit more, imagine that we're all like on a bus, right? Going from one destination to the other, birth to death. Typically for most people, someone else is driving the bus and we're just kind of going with the flow of wherever that bus is going. We occasionally get off, maybe get onto a different bus, but someone's almost always driving the bus. When you are able to control what you're thinking, how you're moving through life, what you want in life, that's like you getting to drive the bus for yourself. And now other people are passengers on your journey, right? And that is a really, really big deal. So Think and Grow Rich, uh, Feeling is a Secret, those two books really will help you kind of understand that concept um, in more detail. Um, uh, Atomic Habits, that one is amazing uh, because so many of us just have bad habits unconsciously and you know, Atomic Habits just provides a lot of different ways to, uh, to really say, hey, here are things that I can do to uh, to try and um, and change my habits. Like right over there on my shelf, I have a habit tracker. All it is is a jar and some pennies. I have exactly 90 pennies on there. Every day that I successfully do whatever the habit is, I drop a penny into the jar. When all the pennies are gone and they're now all in the jar, I know that I've done this thing for 90 days. Without counting the days or having to really think about it, I want my penny every day. <laughs> so tip, that right? Yes, that one uh, that one came from Atomic Habits. So I could go on and on, but definitely read because again, only stupid people know everything and they hide the best information in the books. So mm -hmm. yes, yeah. definitely read. Great, great recommendations. I think I read two of them 
but I got to read the other two as well. Okay. All right, great. So the last question for you is where can people find more about you? You can go to oxfordpierpont.com. If you don't know, um, you know, if you forget our name or how to spell it, you can just go uh, to Google, start typing Oxford P and we show up, they know who we are. How did you come up with that name, Oxford Pierpont? Uh, rhyming dictionary. <laughs> but all jokes aside, um, so uh, J.P. Morgan, everyone knows who, well, a lot of people know who J.P. Morgan is, Wizard of Wall Street. A lot of people don't know that the P stands for Pierpont, John Pierpont Morgan. Um, um, the Oxford Highland Group, they were my very first client after I lost my job. So a little, uh, little homage to them. So that's where the name uh, comes from, really. Um, and then outside of Oxford, uh, my business credit definitely go to mybusinesscredit.com. We provide a lot of free resources for people who are trying to get funded, trying to grow their businesses, build their business credit, over 150 fully animated videos um, that'll teach you step-by-step, step. like, hey, here's everything that you need to do. Vendor databases, um, credit card databases, resources, all that stuff is there. And we also built our own little Facebook. So definitely go to mybusinesscredit.com to contact us and, and work with us more that way. Cool, great. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Bob. This is really helpful. I learned a lot from the conversation. Thanks for sharing. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you for having me and you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.